everyone. Uh, so I stand between you and coffee break, which I think is a little bit better than standing between you and lunch. <laughs> well, um, I remember uh, 10 years ago in uh, 1999, when I was a doctoral student, uh, I participated in this consortium. And, uh, I was, uh, I was uh, sitting in a room like this hearing uh, uh, some of the scholars speak about their research area. And I think it's very nice feeling for me to be uh, invited back here to be with uh, many of my uh, distinguished colleagues uh, to participate here. So uh, I want to thank Mike for this uh, invitation. Uh, let me begin by taking a survey. How many of you here are uh, doing your dissertation on market microstructure? Okay, actually, that's a little bit more than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, right now, corporate, corporate finance and asset pricing is sort of bread and butter, so you'll always have dissertations written on it. Uh, Ten years ago, there were a lot more dissertation written on market microstructure following Christian Schultz and, you know, a lot of debate about design of markets. Um, so today, corporate governance is, I think, uh, a very uh, uh, interesting area to work on. Uh, banking and intermediation, I suspect, a year or two from now, is going to be a lot of papers just because of the crisis, just because of the interest in that area. So what I thought I can do is sort of perk your interest a little bit in market microstructure and uh, talk about a few uh, what I think are interesting unresolved issues that we're still trying to understand. Okay, so that's my, uh, that's my objective here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about design of markets and some interesting questions related to that. A uh, little bit about trading costs, uh, commonality and liquidity, and then uh, when you put together a you know, talk for a consortium, there are a lot of things that come to your mind and say, oh, I'd like to say something about this or that. So I have a few random observations in the end uh, that, uh, that I uh, gathered on the way. Okay, so what we have seen in the last decade or so is a move towards this electronic limit order book market, right? So most uh, equity markets now are electronic limit order books. You have limit orders coming in, uh, setting up the supply of liquidity, and then market orders would come in and demand liquidity and execute against limit orders, right? Okay, so that should that should work quite well. But there is a big problem. The problem is that this structure works great for the very liquid securities. If the top 100 securities, uh, say on the New York Stock Exchange, in terms of trading volume, the electronic limit order book is great, no problem at all. But if you move away from the top 100 securities, you'll start seeing that the book becomes relatively empty. And this is a concern when you're talking about, say, many of the uh, derivative instruments, the futures contracts, now they're traded on electronic markets, right? So the prompt month contract, which is the most liquid, should be fine, but as you start moving away from the prompt month contract, again, you're gonna find very little liquidity. Uh, corporate bonds, I think, you know, you know, soon is also going to be traded in this sort of a market structure. It's moving in that direction. So, so this is a problem that's going to be uh, something that we need to think about carefully. Here's some um, work on how the book looks. This is from uh, Euronext Paris. Uh, this is a uh, work that uh, Hank Besselmander, Marius uh, Panahidis, and I did for uh, one of our papers on uh, 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 hidden liquidity. And so we have the most liquid stocks up there. Um, not you know sort of the mid tier in the second uh, row here, and then the least liquid stocks in the bottom. And the uh, x-axis has the same uh, distance from say the port midpoint. Okay, so we are holding uh, the distance from say the port midpoint, which may be a proxy for the efficient price. The same. We are moving in both directions. And what you can see is the big difference between the number of orders, the cumulative depth for the least liquid stocks and the most liquid stocks. Okay. So the idea again is that. The book is quite empty for the least liquid stocks. Now, what is the solution? So what have electronics, uh, uh, electronic markets done? They have introduced a market maker, a designated market maker with an affirmative obligation to maintain markets, which I think is very interesting, right? Because this is what exactly an NYC specialist did, correct? So it looks like we moved to an electronic world, but then we are finding out that some of the features of the old world uh, that they're not, you know, that we thought were not so good uh, is coming back. Uh, similarly, you know, uh, when you think about electronic markets and you look at the least liquid stocks, many of these stocks are executed in the upstairs market. Okay, and what is an upstairs market? An upstairs market is really a telephonic market where uh, an upstairs broker, you call up a broker and say, look, I want to buy this illiquid stock and I want to sell this illiquid stock. And the broker will then call up other institutions who may be interested and then he put together the other side and then facilitates the trade. Which is sort of interesting, right? Because it looks like uh, intermediaries, human intermediaries, play an important role because 
they bring to the market what we call unexpressed liquidity. There's a lot of liquidity out there um, that is not really in the book. It's not committed, it's not displayed. And that's the liquidity that you would need to reach out for if the book is not deep. Okay? So there's still a role for uh, a human intermediary in this electronic world, which I think is an interesting uh, point to know. So we introduced a uh, market maker who has some affirmative obligations, and this is going on in almost all electronic markets now. Then it brings up some interesting questions. The first one is, what is the socially optimal set of affirmative obligations? What should this obligation be? So the most common one would be that this uh, market maker, this specialist, um, makes sure that the spreads do not widen beyond a certain point. Okay, so if public liquidity is lacking, then he would come in and put in his limit orders so that the spread is narrow. Uh, in some markets, you might also have uh, some uh, uh, obligations related to price continuity stabilization. So when there is a, say a large sell order comes in and there is insufficient liquidity in the book, it's going to walk through the book and prices will go down. And then eventually the prices will recover. So that introduces a transitory volatility, uh, which would be uh, one measure of market quality that and we would like to improve uh, uh, in reduced transitory volatility. So uh, that could be another obligation. Now what's not clear is exactly how do you think about you know, the basic economics? How do you really think about what should be the obligation and what should be the extent of obligation uh, and such? And uh, uh, Andrew talked about Mike Lemon's work in corporate governance, corporate finance, and not surprisingly, uh, Mike has a paper on what should be the um, uh, set of affirmative obligations uh, in, in such a market structure. Okay, so if you're interested in that topic, you can uh, look at uh, Mike's work with uh, Hank and um, then the really interesting question is, how should this market maker be compensated? So the fact that we need a market maker means that someone like you and me who's trading from a profit motive is not willing to stay there and provide those quotes, right? And the reason why we are not willing to do that is because it's not profitable. For example, information asymmetry increases, we pull back. But we force a designated market maker to stay there and provide liquidity. So he's making losses in those time periods, correct? So he needs to be compensated for that loss or he's not going to do it. So in the old NYC world, what did we do? We said, look, you, the specialist, uh, we are going to give you some superior access to information. So you, you can see the order flow information better. So it helps you control your risk of providing this affirmative obligation and leaning against the wind, right? And so you can uh, make your money at other times when uh, market conditions are better. But in an electronic world, we want it to be fair, right? So we want to give equal access to all market participants. No one gets privileged access to order flow information. Right? So how do, you, how do you make sure that this market maker does not go bust? Someone needs to pay him or her for that obligation. And so there are many models that are out there. For example, the listed firm. So uh, if uh, firm X is uh, employing a market maker to provide liquidity in the stock, and it makes sense to do that if you believe that uh, liquidity affects the cost of capital. So uh, if, you know, by having a liquidity provider who reduces, who improves liquidity, you can lower the cost of capital. Right? So that's one way of internalizing the cost. So uh, the listed firm uh, compensates this designated market maker. So in that case, uh, uh, what about conflicts of interest? There's you know, the worry about price manipulation. In other markets, um, an exchange might use a designated market maker as a way of making itself more attractive. So exchanges are competing for the flow, and one exchange has uh, one or two designated market makers. So uh, you, you know, when you need immediacy, you're more likely to find it in this market. And so that helps attract order flow to this market and allows it to be uh, allows it to compete for order flow, right? So then the exchange might share some of the data feed uh, that it earns on the quotes that it designates to the market, right? So there are various models out there, but there's not enough research now uh, understanding uh, conceptually, theoretically, uh, what how how do these mechanisms of compensation work? And then finally, I think we need empirical work uh, examining whether you know the conflicts of interest that might arise, how is that resolved and Okay, so there's a lot of work to be done in this area. Um, then there's whole issue of transparency. So when we think about transparency, we're thinking about information. We can think about information before a trade, which would be, uh, say, the best bid and ask quote. We can think about information beyond the quotes, which would be the entire book. Uh, and then we can think about post-trade information, which is after a trade happens, uh, you know, do we post the, the price, uh, the quantity, uh, that is traded, and more information, say for example, who's on the buy and who's on the sell side, if you choose to do that, right? So this, this relates to pre and post-trade transparency. And then there's a whole debate about 
uh, how much transparency should we have? There is research suggesting that if you have too little transparency, then it hurts market quality. For example, the corporate bond market was just opaque uh, before 2002, before trace was introduced. There's just no information about trades. There was very little information about quotes. So if you're trading a corporate bond and you walk to a dealer and said, I want to buy this bond, he would give you a price, but you have no idea whether it's a good price or not, right? And what we find is that uh, once trace is introduced, uh, market quality has improved significantly in terms of the markups that dealers charge on uh, facilitating an execution, right? But on the other hand, there is also research, and there's from several markets, suggesting that too much transparency hurts market quality. So for example, if you start revealing the name of the broker who's on the uh, best bid and offer, or away from the quotes, okay? Or if you start revealing who are the traders on the buy and the sell side after the trade, then, you know, any, any trading is like, it's like a basketball game if you change a three-point shot from a three-point to a five-point shot, right, is going to change entirely the offense, the dynamics of the offense and the defense, right? So when you change what is revealed, it changes the way people trade, and that completely changes the way in which prices evolve and liquidity evolves and things like that. And what we find is that too much transparency hurts market quality. So there's this whole debate about what should be the optimal amount of transparency, what should we do about off-exchange trading. So there's a lot of trading that's going on outside the exchange. Should these be reported? Uh, some markets say yes, some markets say no, and there are good arguments for and against it. So this is again something that we are trying to figure out. Um, if data is made public, should it be free? Uh, who does this data belong to? If I send in an order which is sitting at the best price, then if that information is revealed to everybody, should I get compensated? Because it's my order after all that's sitting at the best price. Or uh, should it belong to the exchange, which is collecting all these orders and sending it out? Right. So this is the data fee is a big issue. It's about 40, 50 percent of the revenue for an exchange at this point. So it's it's really a very interesting topic. And who should set the price for market data? Uh, a few years ago, when uh, Larry Harris was the chief economist he, at uh, the SEC, he came up with this sort of complex formula, which uh, decides how this data generation fee is going to be distributed based on price discovery. Okay. Now, uh, do we need a regulator doing it? Can just market forces do it? Uh, should we only look at price discovery as a dimension of market quality? Should we look at other dimensions of market quality? How do you think about this, right? That's an interesting uh, problem as well. Uh, consolidation versus fragmentation. So the goal of setting up a market is to make it efficient, transparent, fair, right? And one way in which you can do that is by <coughs> consolidating all the order flow to one market center. So that way every order meets with every order. And as long as you have the right priority rules uh, to encourage competition, you would make sure that somebody who's demanding liquidity is able to do is able to execute at a low cost. Right? So that's sort of the idea. But then if you force everything to consolidate in one market, then it hinders competition. Because if everything is going to one market, then uh, competitors uh, will not be able to compete just because everybody wants to trade where everybody else is going to like to trade. Right? There's a net network effect. To, uh, uh, consolidation. So the SEC and the others have uh, come up with rules over the years which actually fosters uh, more competition. So what we have today is an extremely fragmented market. Uh, when I look at the TAC data today, first of all, the TAC data is getting really unwieldy because of all this electronic trading. If you have downloaded a month of data in uh, 2008, say the last six months, uh, it's just scary, just the amount of data that's out there, mm -hmm. right? Because these auto codes and, you know, it's just a millisecond quotes that are being generated. Mm -hmm. And then the other big problem when you're looking at research using uh, sort of the TAC data, microstructure research is you have to worry about the self-selection of where these orders are going. It's so fragmented, there are so many markets uh, which are making, uh, you know, which are viable options and an order gets rooted to a particular market. And so you need to think about the self-selection process in that context. So there are questions about how do we consolidate these different markets? How do we consolidate liquidity that is displayed versus liquidity that is not displayed. So in many markets, you can uh, sh reveal a part of your order, and then you can hide a portion of your order. Okay? So at every price, limit price in a market, think about 1,000 shares being revealed and then 4,000 shares being hidden. Now, each stock, let's say, is traded in four markets. It's very easy to consolidate the displayed quotes across these four markets because it's displayed. So you know. Goldman Sachs and others can easily just pull all the data and consolidate it, right? But really, when you are consolidating only displayed codes, you are really skipping through all the undisplayed liquidity, and that's going to vary across markets, right? So when you're defining best execution, how do you really define it? How do you define? It? Is it simply price? Is it something going to be more complicated than that? How do you measure best execution, right? And implementation costs are 
you know, 50, 60 basis points if you look at the average implementation for an institutional investor. It's really expensive to take a position or get out of a position. You know, it's 0.6% to get in, 0.6% to get out. So it's not trivial, right? So understanding how to define best execution is uh, something that's, uh, uh, that needs more thought. And then finally, I, I think market, market microstructure is a really interesting field because uh, regulators come up with a set of rules and then technology just gets more sophisticated and then you know the rules suddenly become open, you know, really outdated. So for example, this whole business of flash trading, the, to, to, uh, to bring it to a nutshell, uh, the reason why, why flash trading was allowed uh, was because the SEC felt that one second was not a big deal. So if there was a delay of one second across markets, that's fine. And that was okay six years ago. But today, uh, one second, uh, you know, is ages, right? I mean, the uh, trades happening within um, in milliseconds, you know, five milliseconds. So uh, that's what, that's another thing that makes this field interesting. Finally, um, since I'm out of time, I'm not going to go into too much detail. But what I'm, what I, what I would like, okay, let's uh, let's take um, there's an efficient price F, and then there are transactions that are happening above and below F. So when we try to model execution costs, we are modeling the changes in F, we observe these transaction prices happening above and below the F, and that deviation is what we call C, which is our execution's um, uh, cost measure. Right? So we put together an equation some, somewhat similar to this, where the change in price is because of new information and because of the bounds in the bid and ask price. And then some component that we, of public information so that we not model. So what we have done is we have come up with an approach to calculating these transaction costs for equity markets, because there, uh, we have uh, the lean and ready algorithm which tells us whether a trade is a buy or a sell. We can model a change in uh, the efficient price using, say, the change in code Bitcoin. And so we can estimate this sort of an equation to get the transaction cost. But then when we move to, say, the corporate bond market, we just the whole approach just came to a standstill. Because uh, the only information you have is a time series of prices. So you don't know whether it's a buy or a sell. You don't have code data to allow you to use a lean and ready type algorithm to decide if it's a buy or a sell. So this equation cannot be used, right? So trace data has now been available for what, six years. And if you really see the number of research articles which looks at execution costs, they're a handful. And that's because although the data is there from a sort of a trading cost perspective, it's impossible to handle. I have you know, myself tried many of these estimators. And you can use the role estimator, a whole bunch of these. But you know, at the end of the day, when you look at those estimates, they're just so noisy that you just are not willing to go ahead and write a paper about it. Okay. The good news, and this is something I wanted to point out, is that since November of 2008, trace data uh, contains uh, information on buys and sells. So now you can actually estimate these transaction costs with a high degree of accuracy. So if any of you have been thinking about corporate bonds as a way to test some of your corporate finance theories um, or you know, asset pricing theories or such, uh, you, know, you can actually think about coming up with estimates now since November 2008 when this data is available. And now, what I want to do is uh, uh, just uh, talk about my uh, random observations, uh, which are just some suggestions that I have uh, for you as you move into um, uh, becoming an uh, uh, assistant professor uh, uh, next year. Uh, first of all, I would say work with your uh, senior colleagues. It's unbelievable how much you learn. Uh, there's a lot more to uh, writing a paper than coming up with sort of the first or the second or the third draft. Uh, exposition is extremely important. And you learn positioning a paper from your senior authors. And in particular, you learn about responding to a referee report. Uh, it's, it's really a very revealing, it was very revealing to me to learn how senior uh, colleagues uh, respond to a referee report, which I think is something that uh, is very important to understand. Uh, think carefully about the possible incremental contributions of a new project at the outset. So I'm not talking about sophisticated econometric techniques on how to fix an econometric problem. I'm talking about sort of the basic economic intuition where you say, why am I writing this paper? What is it that we know today? How will this paper help you know, further our understanding of this particular topic? I think that's something that you need to think about carefully. Uh, hard to obtain data is a huge barrier to entry. Our field is extremely competitive. So if there's any way in which you can get some special data from some special source, uh, it can really help you articulate what it is that you can bring to the table that prior research is not done. It's a very, our, our field is a very high hurdle because you're looking around and you're seeing some of the top scholars, many of them have won Nobel Prizes, and you're trying to write something and publish in the same outlet that they're trying to publish. Right? So it's a really very high hurdle. So anything that you can do to come up you know, that gives you a competitive advantage will go a long way in helping you succeed. 
uh, exposition matters, and I think uh, Jared is going to talk about exposition, so I'll, uh, I'll uh, skip that. Uh, present the paper at every opportunity and solicit feedback uh, in your presentations, and I think this will be useful because many of you will be presenting soon. Uh, embrace the attitude, help me understand your point of view, that is, don't get defensive. No, no paper is perfect, and you know it's okay if somebody says that. Uh, is this something that you have control for? And I think it's okay to say this is a good point, and I need to think more about it. And you know, thank you for the suggestion. I think it, it, it helps you a lot in terms of just being relaxed when you present a paper. Uh, and then finally, try to incorporate every comment in a referee report, even when the paper is rejected. And I think this is really, really, really important. It's hard to do, um, just because a paper, a paper gets rejected because there may be some very good points in the referee report. And when, a, when you get a rejection, you're really very upset about it. Uh, you know, usually, when I get a rejection, my wife does not speak to me for a day. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just stay away from this guy. You know, this is going to be really, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time and effort writing a paper. We feel it's a really good product. And if it gets rejected, it's, it's something really hard to take. But that's just the nature of our business. If you cannot accept rejections, then you should not be an academic. Because it's impossible to be an academic and not get rejections. But it's, it's a way for you to improve your paper. Take every referee comment and say, is this something that I can do something about? And if you can, you should. Okay? Thank you very much.